Hello, and welcome to the Hottest Summer School Colloquium Series. Uh, today, we're very excited to welcome Jonas Fry, who's going to provide an introduction to modalities. Uh, Jonas, take it away. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present here. So um, I haven't followed too many of the summer school talks live, but I've looked into the YouTube channel and I've uh, been on Discord and um, it's great to see so many people participating, so many young people interested in, in homotopy type theory. And yeah, I guess the format is uh, really uh, uh, very innovative and it's kind of the future of summer schools. Um, so, um, yeah, I will, uh, in my announcement, in the abstract, I wrote um, Introduction to Modalities and Cohesive Homotopy Type Theory, I believe, but I won't get to the cohesive um, stuff. That will have to wait for another talk. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I will just be speaking about modalities in homotopy type theory. So, okay, let's start with some motivation. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. So, so there are two things uh, that I think uh, kind of uh, can be thought of uh, as motivation. So one is modal logic. So in modal logic, we take propositional and first or first order logic and we add modal operators to them. And typically in modal logic, we have the modal operators of um, possibility and uh, necessity. And so the way that works is that we take any formula uh, of a logical system, and then we can put, uh, so we can put, for example, necessity in front. And so if uh, and that would, we would read as it is necessary that A, and then if we take a reasonable axiomatization of modal logic, for example, uh, the system S4, which has kind of good properties, category theoretically, then um, certain formulas are tautologies, namely that necessary A always implies necessary, necessary A, and necessary A implies A, and dually, possibly, possibly A implies possibly A and A implies possibly A. And um, for people A, uh, for people who know a little bit of category theory, they will recognize that. So the rules for possibility, um, they look a bit like a, a like a monad, or not not the rules, but these tautologies that I've written. So in a monad, we have arrows from A to monad A and from monad A, monad, monad A to monad A. And so this would be the, the unit, and this would be the multiplication. And dually, uh, the uh, Tautologies for necessity tell us that this behaves like a co-monad. Um, so, and it turns out that since we are interested in this setting in mostly, I mean, traditionally at least in interpretation in pre-orders, um, it's actually a bit simpler because so if we have, um, uh, if we have A implies, I oh, know, sorry, if we have, um, let's say we have A implies box A, 
and as a uh, now diamond A, and we have then we have a kind of functoriality principle that tells us diamond diamond A implies diamond A. And we also have um, diamond A implies uh, this, of course, nonsense what I just wrote. Uh, so what I want to say is, so I add a diamond on each side, that's what I want to do. And then I get diamond A to diamond, diamond A. And I also have diamond, uh, diamond A to diamond A. That's the multiplication of the monad. And if I combine them, then I get diamond A is equivalent to diamond, diamond A. And so that means that model operators are idempotent in model logic. Um, at least in the traditional systems of my logic. So, and that's actually, even though the modalities that I'm going to be speaking about are not at all acting on pole sets, we still pre uh, preserve the strong idempotency principle that we will get um, an equivalence, homotopical equivalence in our case, between applying a modality once and applying a modality twice. So this is one motivation. And for people who are interested in programming and functional programming, there's another analogy that we can make that has to do with monads. And that is Morgi's monadic lambda calculus. So in monadic lambda calculus, you um take a system system of maybe simply typed lambda calculus and you extend it with a type constructor um t and then we have rules that says if um in context gamma t is a term of type a then in the same context gamma eta t is a term of type t a or well, in programming, actually, we don't call this eta, but we call it return. But I'm going to want to stick closely to the terminology that is standard for monads. That's why I call it eta. And so there's the second rule that says that if in context gamma, we have a term S of type TA, and in the extended context gamma XA, we have a term T of type TB, Um, then in the same context gamma, we can form a compound term that we write let x equals s in t, and that's of type tb. Um, and so in programming, these uh, uh, monads are used to model side effects. Um, and so in general, they're not item potent. And so in this sense, actually, they are not that great of a, um, analogy, um, to modalities and type theory. But on the surface, of course, they are pretty similar because it is uh, monadic lambda calculus is kind of like a um, type theory in which we add a model operator and that modalities will, will kind of follow the same pattern. Okay, so that was the motivation. Um, so now let's get started. Oh, how do I do that? Here we go. Um, so, uh, for modalities in 
type theory, um, since they are idempotent, it will turn out that it is a property of a type, whether it is in the image of the modality. And in axiomatizing this, it turns out that it is best to start um, with this property. Um, so, um, so let P from U to U, and uh, no, from U to prop be a predicate on a type theoretic universe U. So, um, we will always assume that U is a univalent axiom. We will be using univalence all the time. And we'll also assume that P is, uh, that U is closed under suitable type constructors. Um, and um, because we want to use this predicate to talk, uh, to axiomatize a monad or a modality, I want to start by subscripting it with a circle because the circle is the notation that we'll be using for type theoretic modalities. So in um, modal logic, we have this uh, box and diamond and in type theory, it somehow it's, has become common always to write circle for modalities. So now given a, a predicate on a universe, we can form a sub-universe um, that we write U circle and that we can define as I'm using set theoretic uh, set comprehension notation where I say it's the, uh, the it's the A in U with the property P circle of A and so this is a subtype which admits an embedding into into the universe U and um, Emily has spoken about uh, subtypes and embeddings. I'm not actually sure if she's uh, ever used this notation. So this is just an alternative notation. For we can also write this as a sigma, and then we would write sigma a in u p a. So if we have a family of uh, propositions and we sigma over them, then we always get a subtype, and because that looks like a um, like, yeah, subset comprehension. I like to actually write it as a subset comprehension. Um, so, so that's what we mean by a sub universe. A sub universe is the data of either a proposition on a universe or the associated subtype. So these two things are equivalent and I leave the, so this embedding morphism, I leave unnamed. So strictly speaking for the, to the data of the equivalence, the, um, the, the, the embedding belongs to the data of the equivalence, but we leave it implicit. Um, uh, yeah, and let me emphasize again, or repeat that you're welcome to ask questions. Um, are there any questions so far? Probably not. Okay. Um, I'm not reading the chat. Um, yeah, don't worry. We've got the chat under control. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. Um, okay. So, okay. So that's a sub universe. Now um, we get a kind of technical definition. So that's now we get started with the technical stuff. Um, we call a sub-universe um, that's right u model subtype of u <clears throat> reflective if um, 
um, for all b in the subuniverse, for all types b, and for all functions f from a to b, and I forgot something. Um, let's see if I can fit it in. No, I have to erase this. I forgot the most. Uh, call it reflective. If um, for all A in U, there exists, and this exists, I want to be reading in the strong type theoretic sense of sigma. Um, Um, a type um, model A in U model together with a function eta from A to model A such that, and now we get to it, for all B in model U, I know in U, U model, in the, and F from A to B, there exists a unique F overline from um, model A <clears throat> to B with F over line after, uh, uh, let's let me write it in one line actually. F over line after eta equals F. So I also am not sure if you've used the exist unique notation. Um, <clears throat> so I, by this, I just want to say that the space of choices is contractible. So we can rewrite this uh, as a um, form type theoretic formula saying that is contractible of um, sigma f bar from model A to B f bar after eta equals f. So, and I will continue using this notation. So you can <clears throat> always, you can consider it syntactic sugar and always rewrite as a contractibility statement. <clears throat> so, um, so, if you have heard of uh, reflective subcategories in category theory, this actually might be familiar to you. And the condition is actually, we can draw it as a diagram and then it's pretty similar. So we say that for every A, for every type A, there exists a model type that you write model A and an arrow from an arrow eta A, where I will often omit the subscript from A to model A. And this data has the following universal property. Um, for all types B and functions from A to B, there exists a unique arrow F bar such that, that the triangle commutes. So, yeah, and I will refer to this as, uh, let's write it like this. universal property like in category theory of the reflective subuniverse um okay and before we come to the actual technical definition of a uh, modality so a modality will be a reflective subuniverse um uh, satisfying an additional property um, but before getting there, let's establish some terminology and prove some lemmas. So terminology. So 
So because we, I said that I want to read the, uh, the exist, exists uh, up here in a strong type theoretic sense, that means that a reflective subuniverse actually comes with a function circle from U to U. And this will be the analogy to the model operator at, or the monad in uh, model logic or programming. And we will also call this a model operator. And then the arrow eta A from A to model A is called model unit. And uh, what does I want to say? Ah, oh, yeah. And then we call a um, in U a model type if um, eta A is an equivalence. And, and strictly speaking, I want to prefix the model here with the circle symbol. So everything should be labeled with a circle. And we call a circle connected if model A is contractible. So it's equivalent to the terminal type. Um, okay, so having established this terminology, let's prove some lemmas. So the first lemma just says that um, so the map from A to model A, so the model unit is determined up to unique equivalence by the universal property by this universal property. Um, and I'm gonna abbreviate universal property as UP. Um, so that's a standard argument, quickly sketch it. That's also, again, if you ha have learned some category theory, you, you will recognize that, otherwise uh, you're learning something. So the idea is that if I have two candidates for a model unit, that I call eta A and eta prime A, and let's call the codomain of this circle prime A, um, then by the universal property of eta A, there exists a unique arrow in this direction, making the triangle commute. And by the universal property of eta prime A, there exists a unique arrow in this direction, making the triangle commute. And then to see, we want to show that these two arrows are mutually inverse. And this is again an application of the um, of the universal property. So if I take these two arrows that I just sketched and I um, write them one after another, I want to so to show that the two dotted arrows are mutually inverse and such so constitute an equivalence and um, we have to show that this composite is an equivalence and the composite the other way around uh, sorry is uh, equal to the identity and similar for the composite the other way around and so to recognize this well um by the universal property again I look at now, I look at the large triangle 
and by the universal property of um, eta. Now let's say it's blue. Eta a, there exists a unique arrow here making the triangle commute. But um, the um, the identity makes it commute and the composition makes it commute, and therefore they're equal. And so I'm sketching the argument in a kind of uh, not very homotopic style, style. So if you want to write it formally, you have to prove that various function spaces are contractible. But this is kind of the argument. And then if you want to formalize it in ACTA, you have to rephrase it with contractibility statements. Um, Great. So a, a question. You mm -hmm. um, you motivated modalities by talking about uh, necessity and possibility at the very beginning. Uh, can we think of either of those as examples in this um, context? Why or why not? That's a very good question. Um, actually, um, I should have mentioned that. So an example. So the answer is no. Um, well, it is, I mean, maybe we can, but it's not what we usually do. So, so yeah, since the uh, modalities in type theory are monadic, we would think about them in analogy to the possibility uh, model operator, but we don't, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to think about them in this way. So, and the example that you have, should have in mind are um, truncation levels. So, for each n, greater or equal minus two, we have a predicate is trunk subscript n that goes from u to um, to prop and this is an example uh, well this is a subuniverse because we have just defined subuniverse so we get um, a corresponding subtype n type subtype of u um, and it will turn out that under mo uh, modest assumptions or mild assumptions on u, this subtype will be reflective, and moreover, um, it will be a modality. Um, does this answer the question? OK. Great. Okay, let's state some more lemmas. Um, so, uh, given A in U, B in U model, and F, G, uh, from model A to B, such that it is a, uh, there are two maps between model types. We have F equals G if, um, if and only if um, F after eta equals G after eta. And so the standard argument for this is, so we have a picture that looks like this. Um, so we have F and G and we have eta, and then we complete this to a triangle by writing F after eta here. And then both F and G make this triangle commute by the um, 
at least if well if we assume the right hand side of the um if we assume uh this implication if we assume no sorry uh we want to prove this implication yeah um so yeah to prove this implication we draw this triangle and then by the universal mapping property of eta um we know that there can only be one filler and so this means that f equals g so this is a classical um, argument and again in type theory actually we would like to have an uh, a so the if and only if here should actually be a homotopy equivalence and one can prove that these types are homotopy equivalent um but actually we only need the logical equivalence, I believe, in the following. And then for this, the, this argument that I sketched, sketched is sufficient. Um, and with this, we can prove another lemma, which says that a type is model if and only if a type A, a type B, let's call it B is model, if and only if for all A and for all F from A to B, there exists a unique. Um, F overline from model A to B with F overline after eta equals F. So that looks similar to the uh, universal mapping property, but now we are um, like writing a characterization of model types. So, um, and the the starting, the starting of the quantifier is slightly different. So we compare this with a universal mapping property. Here we say something for every type, for every model type B. And now we want to characterize one of type model. So we write a condition that uh, quantifies over all A. Um, so I'm also going to give a proof sketch of that. <clears throat> so so first of all, so the one direction is trivial. If a type is model, then it uh, satisfies, satisfies this condition. So conversely, if a type B satisfies this condition, then again, we want to use the universal mapping property somehow. So, or universal property. Um, so, and what we do is that we just, consider the lifting property that looks like this. And then we know there exists a unique um, it overline such that um, it overline after eta equals it. So the definition of a type being modal means that eta is an equivalence. So and to prove that eta is an equivalence, we want to show that it is a two-sided inverse. So now we've already shown that the identity is a, a no, the it overline is an, a one-sided inverse of it. So, um, so we also want to show that 
eta after it overline is equal to the identity, but this would be the identity uh, at the type circle B. And now we use the lemma that I've uh, proven a moment ago. So to prove that a type, that the, the two arrows from a circle type into a modal type are equal, it is sufficient to show that they're equal when post composed with the unit again. So, so this is what we have to show, but it's equivalent. So logically equivalent sufficient right now to um, eta after it overline after it eta equals um, eta. <clears throat> But now we can <clears throat> use the the other equation that we that we already have. Um, sorry. So that one we already have, <clears throat> and with this equation we can cancel on the right, and and then <clears throat> um, no, not that, and. <clears throat> and we get something that is true. So that's also a standard argument, but I thought it's worthwhile going through these standard arguments. Um, okay, so now if we've established some basic lemmas about um, reflective subuniverses. Um, and now, we come to a theorem, and that theorem will characterize modalities. So it will give. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the theorem will give uh, two equivalent statements, and either of them will characterize um, what a modality is. So. The following are equivalent for reflective subuniverses um, more uh, U model included in U. Uh, I'm sorry about my handwriting. I'm not really used to writing on tablets. I came out of practice at least over the last year. Um, so the first statement of the equivalence is that the subuniverse is something called sigma closed. And by this we mean Mm. that for all model types A and model type families B on A, the sigma type um, sigma A in A, B, A, is model. So that means that uh, sigmas of model types indexed by a model type are model. That makes sense to call that sigma closed. So that's very intuitive condition. The second condition is also kind of intuitive if we make it through the formalism, but it's a bit more uh, complicated to write. So we say that U circle admits unique dependent elimination and by this I'm going to put it in quotes and by this I mean that um, uh, 
given any type a not necessarily mona model but then a type family of model types on model a um, and a dependent function f uh, pi a in a b of theta a um, there exists a unique dependent function f tilde that goes from now the product over model a um, b a um, such that um, so the short way to write it is, is f tilde after eta equals f so that's very similar to the condition we had before but usually with dependent functions we don't write composition like that so we write it as a, a pointwise condition and we say that for all a in a um f tilde eta a equals f a and actually i should not write this as a for all because i don't know that the body of the formula is a proposition so in this case i want to write a pi um so um let's try to make sense of that so i like category theory and i always like to write everything as diagram so i want to write a diagram for that so you know uh-huh a quick question about your condition one you wrote uh, um b going from a to u model uh, a the a should not be there right yes thank you okay. that yeah it's a yeah it's a type family of model types on on a yeah so okay so let's write the uh condition about dependent elimination at the diagram so what we have is so we assume that we have a and then we have the model unit into model a and then we have uh, this type family um and so for this of this type family we form the sigma now and so maybe you've seen that that type family so families of types are equivalent to functions into the indexing type and this equivalence is by taking the sigma of the fibers and then here we have a map down which is just the first projection and yeah this is how from a <clears throat> type family we get an arrow into the indexing type and in the other direction we can take the fibers um and so now the dependent function here um we can also uh maybe let's do it in red so we can also integrate this in the diagram or at least i want to write so a function here and i want to write this as angle bracket eta comma f and by this i mean the function defined by angle bracket eta f of a equals eta a comma f of a and so this function makes the triangle commute and giving functions uh, of the red type making the triangle commute is actually equivalent to giving um, dependent functions of this type and 
So what the condition now says is that um, in this situation, we can find a dependent function like this, but again, this dependent function, we can fit into the diagram. Uh, let's do some more colors. So we can somehow fit it into the diagram by putting here um, identity comma F tilde, so which is um, so the function defined by applying this to A is A comma F tilde A. And then it turns out that for a given F, to find an F tilde uh, satisfying uh, this condition is equivalent to uh, finding a blue arrow in the triangle such that um, this commutes and this commutes, meaning that the uh, blue arrow is a section of the projection. So the blue arrow being a section of the projection just says that the first component is an identity. So, and when thinking about uh, this, it makes most sense. Well, for me, I can think about it this by always translating things into diagrams. So and then if you want to formalize it in actor, you have to translate it back. Um, so, okay, let's give a sketch of the proof. So if U is sigma closed, um, okay, and so given a sigma cl closed U and A in U and B from Sigma A from uh, circle A to U and F of type um, pi A and A B of um, eta A. So satisfying. So the data that we have in the condition for A in the of the dependent elimination, well, we um, construct actually pretty much the same diagram that we have A and yeah. So we, we write this diagram, sigma A, B A, and the F gives, gives an arrow here. And now um, we don't want to use the assumption. So the assumption is that, um, that U is sigma closed. And now U being sigma closed tells us that this type here is a model type. And now we use the non-dependent universal property to say, here we have a model type. Here we have a um, we have a model unit, so we can lift against it, um, and we get an arrow here. So let's call this G, and then this is G bar. So we get G bar equals um, G bar after eta equals um, G. So, so in order to verify um, the condition of dependent elimination, well, we have to find kind of verify that G is actually of this form of a pair of arrows where the first one is an identity. And again, so this is equivalent to the second condition that this composite is uh, equal to the identity. So
So it remains to show that G bar after uh, no. remains to show that the projection after G bar equals identity, but by the lemma that we've shown, it is sufficient to check this when post-composing with the modal unit, again, because we are talking about an arrow between modal types. And so if we compose this with the unit, then by commutation of this triangle, this part is equal to G, PR1, circle G, and then by commutation of the outer triangle, this is equal to um, to eta. And from this equality, well, this second equality is precisely this equality that we wanted to show by cost composed by eta. So by the lemma, we are finished. Uh, Um, conversely, I don't know, maybe I should, I'm not going to do the other direction, take the whole hour otherwise. So, um, so the other direction, I mean, you can prove to find the argument in your own, it's pretty similar. So we have to recognize how these two conditions are related. Um, So now we say definition, a modality is a Raffle subuniverse satisfying the conditions of the theorem. So equivalently, a modality is either a sigma closed reflective, a reflective subuniverse or a reflective subuniverse um, that admits this dependent elimination principle. And if you look in the homotopy type theory book or in Eckbert and Mike Schulman and Bas Bitter's paper on modalities, you will see that the official definition of modality is written slightly different because the starting data in, the, in their case is not the reflective subuniverse, but it is the modal operator. And if we start with the uh, modal operator as starting data, then we don't know yet that this model is a property. So to give a definition that does not rely on this, it has to be written a bit different, but I, um, it is equivalent and I will not write down the so-called official definition because I also think these two are quite memorable. So um, if you know that a modality is a sigma closed reflective subuniverse, then you can be perfectly happy. Um, uh, that's a very good characterization. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about examples. So I've already told you that truncation uh, gives rise to modalities. So we have n type included in u for n greater or equal minus two. Um, so if we want to prove that these uh, modalities, we first have to show that the subtype of n types are 
um, reflective. Um, proof of reflectivity. And I don't believe I've, I've looked at uh, Emily's and Eckbert's uh, courses, and I don't think you, you've treated that. Otherwise, please correct me if I'm wrong. So I want to quickly discuss it. Um, Just for propositional truncation. The propositional truncation, yeah. So, um, well, so there are different different ways of proving that these types are, are reflective. Um, so we have to show that for each type A, there is an N type that we write A double bar N. And the model unit in this case, and introducing the standard notation, is written like this, um, such that for each n truncated type B, there exists a unique, and for each F, there exists a unique F bar. Um, so there are different uh, construction of these so-called n truncations. So in the homotopy type theory book, there's a construction of n truncations using the so-called hub and spoke me method. And that's a certain way of writing down higher inductive types. So a slightly more elegant way is uh, what is given in Egbert's book. And there, what you do is that you first um, it's it's a proof by induction. So we recognize that uh, so minus two is trivial. So the two truncation of every type is just the terminal type. Um, minus one is um, propositional truncation. And that uh, has been already discussed. So you can either do it with um, Egbert's join construction, or there's also another way um, that I don't know if you've done Eckbert, so you can also, in using impredicativity or propositional resizing, you can write the uh, the minus one truncation of a type as um, for all Q in prop A implies Q implies Q. So if um, Q is a proposition, then because proposi propositions are closed under pies, um, this type is a proposition and propositions are closed under for alls. Well, no, they're closed under arrows. So in both cases, because they're closed under products. So this thing turns out to be a proposition and it turns out that it is the like the least proposition, proposition that a can be embedded into, so it satisfies the universal property. So this is um, um, an impredicative argument. So, it, so for this uh, construction to end up in the same universe that you started in, you need propositional resizing. Um, and if you don't like that, then you can use uh, the joint construction that I what I is what what I believe that actor has described. So okay. 
So now for the inductive step, assume N trunk is reflective um, and then let A be N plus, shouldn't write element symbols, A in the subuniverse of N plus one truncated. Um, types um, and so what we do now is that we define a function that goes from a to uh, u to the a and so this function what is called r n following Eckbert's book and that's defined by r n of a equals lambda b a equals b so it's just the currying of the identity type and um because um a is n truncated that fact it, because a is n plus one truncated its identity types are n truncated and that means that our n factors through the subtype and i'm not even sure if it's a subtype but it factors through the canonical arrow from n type to the a to u to the a so we're really not produce not merely producing families of types but families of n types uh, and now we take the image factorization of um this um of this function and so i'm just going to call this f and oh, I'm going to stick this Rn. Um, so this is the writing it as a set comprehension. This is again the set of f from a to um, u such that there merely exists um, and a with f with r n a equals f and so this will turn out to be the end truncation sorry this will uh, turn out to be the the n plus one truncation so basically um, the idea is that um, we construct n plus one truncations. Oh, and I, Ekbert didn't correct me. Um, we construct n plus one truncations by n truncating identity types. That's the idea. And then doing this currying ar argument and factoring through a power of the universe um, and taking the image. And this gives n truncation, n plus one truncation. And you also wrote that you assumed that A is n plus one truncated. Um, but that assumption shouldn't be there, right? Uh, you're right, yeah. That's also nonsense. And you wrote exists unique for an ordinary exist in the set binder notation. Uh, no, that should be the image. For the image, we take the, it should the, the be truncation an, of the fiber, isn't it? It should be mere exists, uh, you wrote exists unique. <sighs> okay, um, you're right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, no worries. Yeah, so mere exists and that, 
So, so this is equivalent to the fiber of Rn Well, to sigma of the fibers, yeah. Yeah, sigma f from a to u fib, no truncation of the fiber r n f minus one. This should be it. Um, yeah, so here we have to use the n plus n minus one truncation in each step of the induction to get the higher truncations. So, okay. Um, this is how we construct n plus one truncations or general n truncations. Um, okay. And these are, as I said, kind of the canonical or the, the standard examples of um, modalities. So, and these, mod, um, so the importance of these things only became clear when, <clears throat> when going to higher homotopical mathematics, because, well, if we're doing set level mathematics, then the only truncations we have is minus two and minus one. And they're, well, it was not, rec they were not recognized as a kind of a, class of interesting structures to consider. But I mean, there are also some modalities that come from, um, uh, that come from a, tr a traditional uh, one category theory, particular topos theory. And so these are open and closed modalities. So the open and closed modalities work as follows. So we take a fixed proposition and then we define op Q and CLQ from prop to prop. Uh, no, from U to U. And we define op Q of A equals A to the to the Q and closed Q of A equals um, A star Q, where the star is the suspension. which is defined as a push out. So the suspension is the push out of, so we take the product of two types and then we take the two projections and we form the push out and that is written and that is the suspension. Um, Jonas, I still join. <laughs> Thank you. That's the join. Uh, there's a question from the chat. Um, uh -huh. The question says, how different are general modalities from truncations? Uh, I think maybe you are getting to that. So, um, well, I mean, there are, there are interesting modalities that are not truncations. And I'm gonna try to give you an overview of this world of um, modalities. Um, uh, so, I, <laughs> Edward, uh, it sounds like you have a particular answer in mind. I don't know if you want to give it now or tell me, add later what you have to say. Otherwise. Oh, um, no, I wasn't thinking about uh, anything. Um, I, I would say that in general, um, the truncations are a very uh, good model of, of what you can do with the general modality because um 
okay of course not all modalities are truncations there are a lot other modalities too but uh, they all behave like that yeah so yes i mean they give a it's a large class of modalities that give you a big impression of the general spectrum of things that can happen with modalities but uh, yeah so it is sufficient to have a good understanding of what modalities are to think about truncations but there are other interesting examples not notably um the open and closed modalities and they um are different from truncations in that they are lex modalities and that means that when we think about them as functors, they preserve finite limits. Um, and so these things come from Topos theory. And now you may say, okay, I'm using homotopy type theory as a language for homotopy types. And I'm a classical mathematician. And then, well, what could, what, what in, if you're a classical mathematician, then the universe of propositions is not very large. It only has two elements. And so if you only have a bottom, if you only have a truth and falsity in prop as in classical homotopy types, then we, I mean, you don't get anything interesting from these constructions, but you get very interesting results from these constructions if you apply them in other toposes. And um, yeah, John Sterling also has recently done a lot of work with these open and closed modalities in a one topos setting, but well, this lifts uh, straight to infinity toposes. So, okay, I let me mention localization and nullification. Um, so that's another source of very interesting um, modalities. Um, so I'm going to give a slightly simplified version. So if um, f from b to a is a function call a type x um, f local if the induced map from x to a to x to b which we can write x to f and which maps h to um, h after f. So it's a precomposition. If this map is an equivalence. So, um, then we get a subuniverse f local types of u and using higher inductive types one can always show and that has been done in the paper of uh, Rick Schulman and Spitters that this subuniverse um, is reflective. And so we speak of localization at a type. And then there's a very simple, sufficient criterion for when this construction uh, actually gives a modality. Uh, So it's so the exact universe is sigma closed whenever um, 
a it's a contractible type. So if the family if the function f from b to a is actually a function into a terminal type, then we are just so we have b to one. And then we speak uh, not of localization but of not nullification and then we get we always get modalities and that's a um, procedure to get a very rich class of modalities so for example what you can do is you take any old group uh, that you know from uh, from undergrad mathematics you take the classifying space of the group and then you nullify your types at the classifying space of this group and you get a very interesting modality and uh, Christensen and Sokola, I believe, have written a paper about this. And a lot of interesting things are going on there. And so another um, situation where this occurs, and is in cohesive homotopy type theory. So in cohesive homotopy type theory, um, what we do is that we, and strictly speaking, I wanna focus on real cohesive homotopy type theory, we postulate a type that we call R, or actually we don't postulate it. Um, in cohesive homotopy type theory, we nullify at the Dedekind reals. And so if, if you do this, in ordinary um, homotopy types, if you nullify at the Dedekind reals, well, there the Dedekind reals form a discrete type. And if you nullify at any discrete type, then basically you get, I mean, at any discrete type with at least two elements, you get um, a propositional truncation. But if we do this in other toposes, then we get an very interesting effects and we get a construction that does actually not decrease the truncation level but um, increase the homotopy uh, the truncation level and this is something that is called the shape modality and the idea here is that um, so this yields the shape modality in so-called cohesive toposes. So this works. So the class of toposes that this works in has a property um, that um, they internalize a so-called topological structure and. So usually, if we think about homotopy on topology, we think about topological spaces as um, being representations of homotopy types. But this is not the point of view that we're here to, to, taking here. So you can also think about a universe where you both have uh, spaces of a topological nature and spaces of a homotopical nature, and they exist on a kind of orthogonal axis. And in this world, um, the nullif so the R here would be purely topological. And if we nullify at the topological object, that means that we kind of uh, eliminate all the topological structure and what this uh, what remains is a purely homotopical structure. And this is 
how we should think about the shape modality. And this is kind of a starting um, point for cohesive topos theory. And I think I will stop here so that we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks very much. So All right, uh, so any additional questions for Jonas? Uh, so a question, do we have an internal language of higher quasi-topoi uh, expressed using modalities? Um, so, uh, I don't, so let me just tell you what I think of when I hear this question. I don't know if that's the direction that you're going in. Um, so in traditional topos theory, we have uh, Leviatini topologies. And if I have E a topos, then and J a Leviatini topology on the subobject classifier of E, then we get a category. Um, let me write it here. I get a category of J sheaves, and that's a subcategory of A. And then there's also a category of J separ separated objects. And so, and that sits between the J sheaves and E. And this is a quasi topos. Um, so now with modalities, we can do something slightly similar. So if we have E an infinity topos and we have uh, then a modality on E, let's write it like this, then we get, we can think, I mean, the the sheaves we can think of, I mean, the analogy of, to the sheaves are the modal objects. So we get the full subcategory of modal objects. And there is also a subcategory of separated objects for the modality. And um, so the separated objects for the modalities are those where the, I think the identity types are modal. And um, so this, but this gives a way of producing quasi toposes using what or producing that gives a way analogous to the construction of quasi toposes in the world of modalities. So I don't think that answers your question at all, but um, uh, I don't know, does this go in the direction you're thinking of, or are you thinking of something completely different? Uh, this was not my question, but it does seem to me that that's in the right direction. Um, yeah, I, I was. Uh, uh, but ha hang on, let's let's see if we can hear uh, directly from the questioner. Yeah, so uh, the infinity topos is a Grothendieck infinity topos, right? Wait, just just confirming. Well, um, so the theory is elementary, so that should all work directly on elementary infinity toposes, um, whatever they are. And because, I mean, an elementary infinity topos should definitely allow us to interpret homotopy type theory internally and admit some higher inductive types. And that means that we can do, we should be able to do the theory of modalities in any elementary topos, but the theory of elementary infinity topos has not been developed. So for now, we only have Grothendieck infinity topos. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great, any other questions? All 
All right. Uh, I think we'll uh, stop the recording here and thank Jonas again. Um, and for uh, there, so there are two more colloquia coming upcoming in this series happening next week on Monday and Wednesday. Uh, so Favonia on Monday will tell us about Cartesian cubicle type theories, and then Chaitanya on Wednesday uh, will tell us about uh, semantics of homotopy type theory. So hope to see you all then. <laughs>